Thanks, Serena. Um, I'll give it a try on this microphone, see how we get on. Um, so it goes without saying that climate change is here, now, and extreme. We've all been listening to the news over the last week. We've seen Illinois devastated. Uh, we've seen the Philippines devastated. But what's quite unusual is to think how close this is also to home. Because I, I watched a tornado go across London a few years ago. It was a very small mini tornado, but it did actually destroy some roofs in North London. So climate change is really here, right now, in the UK. And also, we've got the terrible floods that happened a couple of years ago in the UK. So we're beginning to share this phenomena around the world. And so what we're talking about um, in this forum is resilience. And I thought it'd be useful just to throw up a quick definition uh, from the UN. Um, and it's basically, it's about the ability of a system or a community or a society to recover fundamentally to recover from the effects of a hazard or, or some extreme situation in a way that preserves how it carries on functioning and, and in a way this ties into Peter's talk very much about being able to restore its essential basic structures, you know, its essential meanings without losing those meanings. And again, following on from Peter's lecture, I feel that we are at a moment in time when we're at a crossroads. And there are two choices in front of us in terms of buildings. We can either take the path towards smart, active buildings, which do everything for us, which feed us, um, which give us automatic lighting, automatic heating, which give us a, a drink, um, or we can carry it on along the path that Peter laid out for us, which is the path of hapticity. And that's working with passive buildings, and I mean passive in an active sense, if you can get that kind of contradistinction. Passive buildings that actually demand that we interact with them, that reach out to us. And I guess the question that's in the room is which is more resilient? Which is actually going to take us into a resilient future? The slide at the bottom here um, fascinates me. This is a, an artist who has implanted a computer into his forearm. And it's really it's a statement to say, where, where are we going to? How many of us ride bicycles with our iPhones plugged in? How many of us walk down the road with our iPhones plugged in? How many of us are already mediating the world through electronics? every day in a way that's actually taking us out of touch with the world. And he's, he's really making a protest here and saying, watch out, we could get to a point where human senses are actually taken away by virtual reality. So what do we do with all this information that's around us? We've got all this smartness that's coming into cities. We talk about smart cities, smart buildings, smart gadgets. Well, there are several things going on with capitalism. Being smart is about controlling people. It's about controlling how we access resources. And it's about making sure that we don't take too much of one, one resource in a city, in case there's not enough of it to go around. So when we talk about smart metering, it's not necessarily about making our lives more comfortable. It's quite possibly about making our lives more compliant. Because actually what the subtext to smart metering is in our homes is that the electricity companies can then charge the price of electricity they want in order to change our behaviours. So in other words, if there's a peak, and you've all just watched um, England play Germany, I think that, was that on tonight? Tomorrow? Um, and you all want to go and make a cup of tea, the electricity board will suddenly put the price of electricity up and then maybe you'll think twice about making that cup of tea or coffee. So that's one thing we can do with data. We've got other choices. We can use that data to actually encourage people to go to, to good things, to say, well, actually, if you're in the information commons just now, it's really crowded in one of the libraries, so why don't you head, up, head on up to this other room where there's nobody there, and you'll have a much better time. Maybe that's a more positive way 
But again, there's the dark side to that as well, which is, you know, are we being manipulated into someone else's comfortable reality? There is a third way, which is the way that, the, the way that particularly interests me, and that's us trying to improve our understanding of how people use buildings and places in the city and feeding this into design and actually making design a better proposition. So we need to fix into, uh, put into this mix the fact that we are people, we're human beings. We're the best sensors in the world, but the trouble is we're anarchic and the scientists don't know how to calibrate us. We know when we're uncomfortable and we'll automatically try and make ourselves comfortable. But in fact, do we? There's a little story about this uh, um, comfort-making machine, this mechanical ventilation machine. I just read a paper a couple of days ago where there was a family living in a house with one of these machines and the house got more and more and more humid, wetter and wetter. And they carried on for a month with this really kind of humid house. Did they open the windows? No, they didn't. Because they'd been told that with this machine they didn't need to open the windows. So for a whole month this family lived in super humid conditions, thinking that they were living in a good environment. Then they were told by the researchers that actually this machine was broken. And in fact had been broken for a month. <laughs> now so the interesting thing there is that machines are changing our behavior. And the question is, how far do we want that to go? Then we need to think about time, and again this ties into Peter's lecture. And one of my heroes is a guy called Stuart Brand, although I'm not sure I share his views about nuclear power. But he's written two brilliant books. One's called How Buildings Learn, and the other is called The Clock of the Long Now. And it's a very small book, and it's one that I've put on your reading list. But in The Long Now, Brand is basically making a plea in the same way that Peter is, which is that we take time. We take time and we slow down. And we need to think about resilience through time, not just today. And so for the last 10 minutes or so, I'm just going to give us a quick tour through a potential learning solution, through a potential co-learning solution, where people share through time how to work with buildings, how to live with buildings, how to learn from buildings. And those buildings also learn from them. And it's co-housing, which I'm sure is a familiar concept to many of you, but if it isn't, a quick definition is community living where the design is done with the people who live in the homes and people learn together. And the living is sustainable, social and energy efficient. It started in Denmark and it's catching on here now. And through some research, I looked at three different housing groups and I'd like to pay thanks here to uh, an MH student, Hannah Baker, who's not with us today. But part of this research is based on her dissertation, and part of it is based on my own research. Um, and so I put the two together. It's an exciting thing to look at co-housing. The first one I want to take to you is a very, very old community in Rotherham. It's been going for about 33 years. And it's a group of people living in a very, very old building, uh, a listed building that's sev several hundred years old. 12 apartments. Um, very straightforward, low-tech, no insulation. That's what it looks like inside. And you can see they've got a snooker room, which is fantastic. Um, and they've got all, this communal, all these communal facilities that they share. <coughs> and the next one is a very unprepossessing, um, you know, I, wouldn't, I don't think anyone would pretend to the aesthetic of this building. It's a very small little co-housing community around the corner from where I live in Healy. And it's just four, four flats, again with shared facilities. And here you can see the shared kitchen, dining room, living room, and the flats around it. And it's got a little sort of study area upstairs. And it's got a shared uh, laundry. And then the third one, the all singing, all dancing, new co-housing, which has won two awards. It's won the Passive House UK Trust Award for best housing, and then it just recently won the um, National Self-Build um, Housing Award. So this is an award-winning development. And we looked at this development as well. There's 40, 41 houses here, and it's a zero carbon development. That's what it looks like in plan. It's on a river, and it's got a really nice prospect facing south. And that's the shared kitchen. So this is a great heart of, of the community. 
And these are the shared facilities. This is the common, common house where meals happen, meetings happen, learning happens about how to use these new technological homes. And then it's got all sorts of other things like plenty of storage for bikes, um, a guest room for people to stay, children's room, lots of shared facilities. And what I was interested in in all these uh, developments was does the shared learning work? Is it resilient? And so we looked at how the design process happened, how the construction process happened, what happened when these homes were given to the people who moved into them, and what happened afterwards. And we did interviews, and we did questionnaires, and we looked at what was going on, and we studied drawings, and we discussed how the places were managed. And what we discovered was that in the older developments, and in the one that was 30 years old, and the other one that was 20 years old, uh, when we looked at the energy use, the energy use wasn't particularly great, while well, they're old community buildings. They haven't been upgraded though, that's what's interesting. They haven't necessarily learnt with time. And in fact what's happening is there's a lot of extra en energy being used in the common facilities. Um, and there's no particular space saving of the houses around the common facilities being any smaller. So overall one could say that if you go for co-housing, uh, you could over time end up in a situation where you're using more energy than you would have done if you did, didn't. But that's not necessarily a bad thing, because there's a bigger picture here. Um, and again, when we looked at the water, um, slightly below the UK average for the two older ones, and a lot below the average for the new co-housing scheme. So that's quite encouraging. And in terms of the World Wildlife Fund planet indicators, um, these are like uh, indicators for for how well the housing's doing. All three um, have happy occupants, and all three engage with sustainable food processes, and are strong on zero waste, so there's lots of recycling. And a lot of this has to do with the way in which they talk to each other, and the way in which they work the food and waste process through in relation to the housing that they're living in. But not so good for the zero carbon in the water for the older ones. Now, in terms of learning over time, this is what's interesting. In the old hippie group that was started off in the 1980s, they developed ex expertise within the group to handle how they looked after their homes. But they're really not that interested in new technology, so they're sort of preserving their traditional values. In the smaller one, in, in Healy, there was an architect in the group, and she took a lot on. Um, and there was a lot of shared learning to begin with, but again, it's quite a low-tech development. But the interesting one is the new Lancaster development, which is very techy. You know, it's it's passive house. It's got um, <coughs> micro hydro. It's got PVs. It's got solar thermal. It's got everything. And so, what they did to overcome the difficulties of understanding all this technology is they formed a technology group, and they actually have a formal process of working with the residents. And they're also doing a lot of digital learning by emailing each other. Um, by tweeting, uh, Facebooking, so there's a lot of digital learning going on as well. But when we look at them all over time, we see another interesting thing happening in terms of resilience, which is that the old hippie community has got unheated community spaces which are not being used very much now. People tend to be living on their own more. So the question's begged there, you know, is that a sustainable community? It doesn't seem to have regenerated. And in the one after 18 years of living together, there's one household who's withdrawn completely from the co-housing process. Um, and the others are carrying on together. So these are challenges that happen over time. And with Lancaster, they've only just moved in, so it's too early to say what's going on. But they're very positive about the spaces just now. I'm going to skip this slide. Um, so what's interesting about sharing and self-management is it's not just applicable to co-housing. It, it can apply to any housing situation. But what's particularly unique about the co-housing uh, people is their self-management. And it is arguable in terms of resource use whether perhaps this is a more efficient way of, of dealing with housing communities than going through traditional social housing routes. You have to ask yourself whether you'd need more resource input with a social housing route. The Lancaster people, these are all the things they're doing together now. They're eating together, doing laundry together. 
They're using the, the car club on a regular basis. They're using the guest rooms. They're holding community events. A lot of socialising going on. And so in terms of an aesthetic for architecture, I would argue for spatial redundancy and for buffering in design. And I'd argue that it's good to have shared facilities um, in housing, particularly because it provides a backup system. You know, if the boiler fails in your own flat, who do you call? Where do you go to? Well, at least in the, in the co-housing group, you've got a community room that you can keep warm in. Um, so these things are really important. And I think we're going to increasingly need this kind of spatial and facility buffering in the future in order to deal with the storms and the shocks that are going to come. And there's also a wonderful social robustness um, in this redundant design because of all the social connectivity that's supplied by the shared facilities. If one system fails, another system can take over. And this does challenge the conventional norms and models for housing development because we're still peddling in the UK this kind of buy your own home for yourself, English person's castle is their home model. And maybe we really do need to turn back to these models of, of collective housing. And if we're going to facilitate culture change towards greater resilience, we need to do it through design. And what this kind of design offers, the design of housing with shared facilities, are new social processes to generate this kind of positive cultural change. So in conclusion, I think when we do look to cities, and ultimately this is a, a theory form that must extend from the building to the city, we need to understand our context better first. We need to understand what we're dealing with, but we really need to do co-designing, and co-housing offers a model for this, and co-production to actually make this work. And I do think co-housing does offer a model for resilience in design. And I think increasingly we're going to rely on shared facilities to help the process, the process of shared learning between us and our buildings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Phil. I need to have a check.